Sports Net, and I'm joined here by Thorny Opportunity Fund's Alex Waitslitz. And uh, last time, Alex, you were in here, it's almost a year to the day, and uh, the share price has increased 50% since that time period. Um, and the underlying NTA as well has increased about 30% or e even higher. So all in all, pretty good year for Thorny. Yes, uh, I think we're pretty happy with the, uh, with the year for sure. And uh, I think it was a sort of validation of some of the companies we've invested in. And some of those changes or the value in those companies, it takes a while for them to come through. Uh, but eventually they do come through and this year happened to be see a lot of that come coming through so we're thrilled yeah so speaking of those coming through we had AMA group up approximately 45% diversa up about the same um, service stream was the big winner for the portfolio up about 230 odd percent now what I don't want to talk about too much is those potentially past opportunities but I want to look at right now what you're holding um, there might still be some opportunity in um, the likes of, say, Fairfax. Is it right now a, a play on the, the market undervaluing domain? Is, is that why you're in Fairfax? Well, th well, there is, and I'll come back to Fairfax in a minute, but I, but I would say on some of those companies you've mentioned, ServiceStream and AMA and Money3, which are three of the bigger parts of the portfolio that have performed really well, I think if people look at the results they just put out, and the commentary about their prospects going forward, uh, we believe there's still a lot of uh, potential for those companies to perform even further. Many of them have become dividend payers and grown the dividend. A lot of them, most of them have grown their, both their revenues, EBITDA lines, and uh, their position in the marketplace. So we think there's a lot of upside in those stocks and, uh, and therefore we've, we've still kept a pretty big part of our position uh, in those companies uh, for what we st can still see ahead. Even though we have seen a few announcements recently regarding, say, service stream, you've been taking a bit of profit, is that correct? Oh, yes. Well, we had about 30 or 29 percent. We've sold one or two percent, so it's a pretty minor stake. Uh, we are getting a lot of pressure from institutions who now want to come on board those companies that they haven't looked at, such as service stream or haven't had a position, and they're they're saying they need to get a certain amount of liquidity or certain size position, otherwise it's not worth their while. So uh, we're prepared to give up a little bit of our holding in order for them to get set because it's better for the company and in its, in its total growth and positioning in the market. So uh, we, we'll trim our holding uh, uh, along those lines and, uh, and we're quite comfortable in, in doing that and taking a little bit of profit off the table. But we certainly think there's more to go. Okay, and, and coming back to Fairfax, so is it is it that domain story? Do you think the market is undervaluing domain? Well, I think what you've got with Fairfax, either they're under undervaluing domain or they're undervaluing the uh, the rest of the assets in the portfolio. And, and and I'll make a couple of comments about that. In the case of domain, you've seen massive growth and massive uh, repositioning and further positioning in the real estate marketplace uh, uh, by the company. And uh, that's seen their EBITDA grow from 25, 30 million a few years ago to, I think they just announced in the order of 110 or 120 million for the period just gone by. So dramatic growth. And uh, if you look at realestate.com on a comparative basis going back uh, three, four or five years, when realestate.com had roughly the same EBITDA of that 120 million, its market cap was uh, over 2 billion just on realestate.com. And the total market cap of Fairfax is just over $2 billion today. So um, I think you're getting all those other assets in the portfolio for nothing really at today's price of Fairfax. Now, what are those other assets worth? And uh, you, know, you can see different valuations, but if you look at the spread, it's somewhere between $500 million and $1 billion uh, of value sitting there. And at the same time, Fairfax has got a... Uh, uh, you know, it's got net cash, uh, so it hasn't got any burden on this balance sheet that's pressuring it from, uh, from banks or anything else like that while they're going through the transition of the old media into the new digital platform, uh, which they're doing well, but I'd like to see them do it even faster. And they're putting themselves in a position of uh, some joint ventures on the other assets like the radio network, which has been backed into a public company, and they've got a shareholding now. And the same is what they're proposing for the New Zealand assets, subject to the regulator appro approving that. So they're actually putting themselves in a position where um, those other businesses can get efficiencies of scale by merging 
Uh, but they're also in a position to uh, take money off the table from those assets if they choose to at a point if in time. So I think uh, the prospect for growth for domain are still very powerful. It uh, wouldn't surprise me if domain is heading to an EBITDA of uh, 200 million in a few years time. And if that's the case, then maybe that's worth uh, three to four billion, just those domain business. And Fairfax today's value is what, 2.3 billion or something. So I think there's a lot of upside on domain itself and there's value in the other assets as well. So, and that's why I've been encouraging the company to buy back its shares because I think they've got the cash flow and the balance sheet to say that's a really value accretive exercise for them to do. Excellent, now let's move on to a much smaller investment uh, in the portfolio, Tasmanian Poppy Enterprises. Um, still not cash flow pro positive, but you've got a, fair f a few big investors in there with yourselves. Where are they at at this point in time? Well, I think in reality, uh, my guess is that they uh, went public about a year too early in their life cycle. Um, but during this past year, even though they haven't uh, been profitable, they have achieved a lot. They've transitioned their, uh, their plant, their factory uh, into Victoria, and that's now commissioned and uh, ready to go. Uh, they've achieved a wider opportunity of uh, growing and diversification out of just Tasmania, where it was in the past, to Victoria, Northern Territory, and there's uh, looking at South Australia, and I think the regulatory environment is opening up for them to do plantings elsewhere. And also out of Europe, they're still waiting for an import license for product out of Europe, which will enable them to uh, have the factory working year round uh, with supply. So a couple of those things had lagged. It took a little bit longer for the factory. It's still taking longer for the permit to come through. But the fundamentals of the company and its prospects for the future are still very strong. Don't, rem don't forget that there's only eight licenses globally to growing poppy and processing, and they've got one of them. So it's a pretty big barrier to entry on a global basis. So we're quite excited about it, but it has taken longer than uh, we would have hoped. Okay, now speaking of excitement, another thing that you're quite excited about as well is the new technology LIC you guys at Thorny will be launching. Can you tell us a bit about that and what you're going to be targeting? Yes, well based on the success of uh, Thorny Opportunities, uh, we realise that there is a value in having um, a publicly listed vehicle which can focus attention uh, on investee companies and bring them out into the spotlight uh, for better or for worse depending on the situation. And we've identified that there's no such vehicle in the technology space that allows a diversification of portfolio across the life cycle of tech companies. So we're looking for a mandate to invest not only in early stage or series A or B, and in particular pre-IPOs, but we're also going to be active in the listed space, which we'll probably be better known for. But in fact, we have been very active in the private equity space on technology companies uh, for quite a number of years. So quite a few venture capital, private equity, uh, tech companies walk through the thorny uh, doors yes. and, and historically as well. Yes, we have a very good deal flow. And in addition to that, we have some global alliances that we've uh, uh, engaged in where we've co-invested and so on, including in San Francisco and in Israel, two of the leading uh, tech startup uh, and advanced uh, nations. And we'll continue to utilize the due diligence that comes from that network and also the uh, an ability to see if technology that's being proposed here is actually unique or commoditized or where does it sit in the global positioning to make sure we're not too narrow in our focus. Uh, but in reality, we're going to focus a lot on the listed sector. There is listed, many listed technology companies and growing listed technology companies. The weighting in the index is going to get bigger with tech companies. We can't avoid it. So our universe of opportunities is going to continue to grow. When you say listed, are we talking at home and abroad in the US predominantly? Uh, uh, no, uh, predominantly I think we'll still focus on Australia, but we'll have the ability to participate also in investments overseas, US included. Um, now the unique thing that we're offering here is if you want to go into a, um, a startup or early stage fund, those are private, you're locked up for four years or five years, there's almost no grey market to exit if you want to on the way through. But what we're proposing is a listed investment company which will give you day-to-day -day liquidity. There'll be a daily share price. You can sell if you want to sell and you need to get the money out. Or, um, and that's a unique kind of proposition. So we're going to say to investors, we're going to create a, a portfolio across the tech space. 
uh, skewed to the pre-IPO and listed space where we'll be our normal active or activist uh, self where we see them. But we'll give an opportunity, hopefully, for high alpha because we'll be getting some of that earlier stuff as well into the mix. Is there a percentage breakdown of proportion of uh, what you're aiming I for? I think we're going to be opportunistic, yeah. but you know, there'll be a skew more towards the pre-IPO, things that will go to IPO within six or 12 months and to the listed space, at least initially anyway. And I think we'll learn all the lessons from the listed investment company of top in terms of how to communicate with the investor base, chairman's type of letter. And I think that's taken us a while to get uh, comfortable with that. But as you've seen in the last uh, 12 months, we've, I think we've improved in how we go about that. And of course, the underlying uh, investee companies, as we said earlier, have, have performed. Excellent. Alex, uh, thanks for joining us. And members, thank you. We'll catch you next time.